This is the third session in the CCS Philosophy of Christian Education program. In this session we're going to be looking at the motive of Christian education. Now, Just as a review, remember we looked at this triangle of necessary and sufficient conditions and we saw that a biblical philosophy deals with all three. As we're thinking about education, we need to think about the proper standard that is, what does the Bible say? How does it apply to our education? We think about the proper motive, that is, what's the heart attitude in education? And we think about the proper goals, that is, what's the outcome of education? And all three of these are important for a biblical philosophy of education. So this session we're going to be focusing on the motive. Now because of the relationship of these three, there will be times when there's overlap between the last session and this one and the next one dealing with the goal because we're looking at the same things from just different perspectives. So uh, if there's overlap, understand that that's the reason for it. So let's think now about the motive of Christian education. And the primary motive is love. After all, that's what we were told in the Bible, the greatest commandment love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. We think about 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Uh, so the motive of Christian education is love. Love for God and love for others. And so we have to see that it's like this. As the song goes, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. We're concerned not just about the outward actions of our students or their intellectual knowledge, but about their heart. We're concerned also about our own heart, the heart of the teachers and the hearts of our students. And because of this, then, we have the importance of regeneration. You see, if we're dealing with the heart, as we think biblically, we need a new heart. And so if you're going to have a new heart, you have to have regeneration, the rebirth. And this only comes about through the working and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so as we deal with Christian education, the issue of regeneration is vital. It is we need to have a regenerate board, administration, faculty, staff, parents, and students. If we're going to have truly Christian education, that all has to take place. Now we realize, of course, that we cannot guarantee any of these. We cannot know that all of our board members are regenerate or any of the other groups, but we can go by credible professions of faith. We also need to realize that, especially when we get to the parents and the students, we are going to have more and more parents and students who are not regenerate. But the thing is that for Christian education, truly to be biblical education, with the proper results in particular, regeneration is vital. So here's where we start thinking about how we keep Christian education from just becoming a list of rules. See, we all know of Christian schools that focus on rules, on do this, don't do this, don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. I mean, you have that old line. And so many people when they think of Christian schools this is what they think of. It's just a place where you do things or you don't do things. Now the problem is that we do need rules. We have to have rules. That's important. Even as we saw in the last session we realized that there is a standard. God gives us his standard. He gives us his law. And so there are rules. We have to do things decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. So don't think that laws are opposed to this motive of love. But how do we bring this out? It's going to involve modeling and actions. It is, do we demonstrate grace and love to our students? Do we show them kindness and love? Or do we just spend our time trying to catch them in violations? We need to explain the rationale for rules and regulations. Why do we forbid students from engaging in public displays of affection? Why do we punish them for being tardy excessively? And start looking at what's behind these rules so that we start getting to the heart of the students. And we want to emphasize this heart motive throughout our education. 
For example, in our Bible class, we need to emphasize the need for a heart love for God, not just looking at the facts of the Bible, even though the facts are important. Uh, we're not going to do away with studying the facts and the history and the uh, details of the Bible, but it has to lead us to a heart that loves God. One another other way of looking at this is in the area of what's called tendency learning. Tendency learning is the idea that we want to instruct students so that they have a tendency to do the right thing. We all know that you have students that uh, they'll behave as long as the teacher is watching. They'll do what's right as long as somebody is making them do it. But if the teacher's back is turned, they're going to misbehave. But you also have students that are going to behave properly, that are going to do what's right, whether anybody's watching them or not. This is what we would like to see. So there's the idea of tendency learning. And you can break this down. We can break the motive. We can break our learning down into these three things. There's knowledge, skills, and tendencies. Knowledge is just what it says. You know what you ought to be doing. Skills is, okay, you've developed the ability to do the right thing. And tendencies says you desire to do the right thing. Okay. And you can compare this, you can think about learning to play the piano. Okay, knowledge would be you know what the notes on a piano are. You know what the notes on the staff are. You can see that when you have a particular note, you know it's a, a, a flat and you know where A flat on the piano is. Okay, that's knowledge. Skills would be, okay, you've learned the right fingering to play a scale. So you can play a C major scale, and you know that you have your fingers one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you know the fingering for the scales. That's a skill. You've learned how to do that. But a tendency would be that you can take the piece of music and you automatically know how to play the notes, you automatically know what fingering to use, it just flows out of you. You're not having to stop and think, okay, now do I need to use my third finger or my fourth finger on this note? Is that note a G sharp or is it an F sharp? You just know it. It's, it's so ingrained in you. Well, that's what we're talking about here in education. We want our students to get to the area of tendencies or what are you likely to do on your own? You know, this focuses on behavior in general, but it does deal with the attitude. There's an excellent book, Educating for Responsible Action, by Nicholas Walterstorff. I would highly encourage you to look this up on Amazon and pick this up. It's a great book. Walterstorff is a Christian uh, philosopher, and he's done some excellent studies in this area. And he points out that developing tendencies in our students, the tendency to do what's right, takes three things. First, it takes instruction. We need to teach our students what they should be doing. We tell them, here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Okay, it's right to cite your sources properly. It's wrong to plagiarize. And you instruct them what is plagiarism. You instruct them what it is to cite your sources properly then you model this so that you show them what the behavior should be like. You show them, for example, even when you're doing PowerPoints for your class, that if there's something that you quote, you cite it properly, that you're not plagiarizing even there. Other ways that you model, maybe you instruct the students how to give to the poor, and then you model it in that you show them how you give to the poor. And then discipline, is just what it says. You punish them if they don't do things right. You encourage them if they do things right. But if you have all three of these things, instruction, modeling, and discipline, it helps to develop tendencies in the students so that their actions start coming more from their heart and not just being something that's punished or something that is forced on them. Now, Let's think about teaching in love. After all, that's what our motive is. Our motive is love. It must be love for God, which includes obedience. Remember our triangle of necessary and sufficient conditions. The motive implies the standard. Well, if you, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So love for God includes obedience, 
but it also includes a heart that longs to please him, a heart that longs to be with him. And then you need to show your students that you love them. It means that you are self-sacrificing. You give up a lot for them. I mean, all of you as teachers could be making more money doing something else. Uh, you could have a job where you go into work at 9 o'clock, you leave at 5, and that's the end of it. And for most of you as teachers, you know that's not what your life is like. You come in here early, you leave late, you take work home to do with you, you're grading papers, you're getting bulletin boards ready, you're getting activities ready, you're doing all kinds of things for the students. You are sacrificing for them. You show them love. You want what's best for your students. You desire their good. And you make hard choices by doing this. This is part of love. It might be something that you have to take an unpopular stand. You punish a student for plagiarism, for example, because you care for that student. If you didn't care for him, you could just say, well, I'll just let him go ahead and plagiarize. I won't deal with it. And when he gets to college, if he kicks out, gets kicked out, that's his own problem. No, you desire the good of the students, and so you do things that are for their benefit. You want them to succeed. You would rejoice if they all got A's on all your tests assuming that your tests actually measure things that they should be learning and they've actually learned well, you want this. That's why we don't grade on a curve here. We don't say, well, only 20% of the students are going to get A's, something like that. Uh, if 100% of the student gets A's, that's great. You want them all to do well. So we want to develop love in our students. We want them to do this. And so, as we said, there are these three aspects. There's modeling. You want to model love with our students, our relationships with them, and our relationships with each other. They should see that teachers have love for one another. Then they should hear how we talk about one another, how we deal with others who sin. We show them what biblical love is like. We can rebuke them biblically, or we can mock them and put them down. So show the students what true love is like. Do we tolerate improper teasing? Do we tolerate verbal bullying? Uh, or do we rebuke it? Do we tolerate racial comments? Uh, how do we deal with these things? We model proper love before your students. Then we need to instruct our students. We teach them how to relate to one another. We tell them the right way that they can speak to one another. Tell them how they can act in love towards us. When opportunities arise, for example, especially as you deal with middle school and high school students, there may be times when the student says something that sounds disrespectful. Sometimes it does show disrespect, and you need to deal with that. But other times, the student may simply not know how to say something, how to question or how to disagree with the teacher in a respectful way. So you can take the student aside and instruct them, here's how you could have said that. It sounded disrespectful. But here's how you should have said what you did. And so you instruct them how to speak in a loving way. And discipline is an important part of developing love in the students. At times, you have to beat the sin out of your students. Uh, don't let unkind and unloving things go by. Rebuke them when needed. Apply school discipline consistently to them. And so this gets to the area of loving discipline. Now, this is what we're focusing on this entire year at, at CCS with the idea of the culture of grace. And so we're not going to go into this a lot here, but the idea here is that we focus on the heart of our students. We want to get to their heart, not just the externals. We want to get beyond, okay, you did this, do this, and don't do that, even though, remember, the externals are important. We do want our students to behave. They need to act in the right way. But you start asking questions to get to their heart. Why are you doing this? Uh, this is not a good question to help get to the heart of the students. If a student is not putting forth his best effort, one thing you can say is, well, do you believe that, it's, that God wants you to do your best? And most of our students will say, yes, God wants me to do my best. And so then you can say, well, what is more important to you than pleasing God. Because if you're not doing your best, then you've decided that there's something else you would rather be doing than what is pleasing to God. That has become an idol for you. 
And so you start getting to the heart of the students in this way. So loving discipline. And remember, there's the need of regeneration. You need to keep pressing your students on this. Now, it's not something that you're going to say, okay, keep beating them over the head with it. Uh, but you do need to point out to the students that, you know, if you're acting like this, if you're continually doing these things, you need to look at your own heart and see, do you really have a new heart? Are you really one of the Jesus' children? And so they need to be asked this, and they need to be pointed to Christ in the need for a new birth, because our work is doomed to failure without it. If a student is not regenerate, he is not eventually going to learn to act in love. But if he is regenerate, we know that the Holy Spirit is going to work and is going to bring about success in his life. And so this is the whole idea of loving discipline here. All right, now in the notes section of your iTunes U course, I'd like for you to give some thought and jot, just jot down some ideas just for your own use. But think about what you have done differently as you have implemented a culture of grace in your classroom. Think about what differences you have seen it make in your students, if you've seen any differences. Jot down some things that you have found difficult as you've done, as you've worked to implement a culture of grace, and think about some things that you might like to do differently or some things you would like to try out in the area of loving discipline, of implementing a culture of grace in your students. So in our next session then, we will begin looking at the goals of Christian education.